So let's consider that you have taken a piece of kidney tissue and you have done very deep, very quantitative measurement of 12,000 proteins. Is that enough to really characterize what is happening with this sample? It's a great start, but that kind of measurement is going to tell you very little about which cells in the kidney express the proteins that you measured. And this is a section of uh, kidney glomeruli. As you can see from this section, there are a lot of different cell types. So from biological perspective, we, if we want to understand that tissue or just about any other tissue in the human body, it is very useful to be able to have measurements that are specific for different cell types for individual cells that build up these tissues. And this is the case not only with tissues, but it's also the case with in vitro experiments that we do in the laboratory. If you start, for example, to differentiate embryonic stem cells into different cell types, let's say you want to do cardiac myocytes for therapy, or you want to produce beta cells, what happens invariably is that cells differentiate into highly heterogeneous mixture of single cells, and then we are very interested to be able to measure which are the cells that have functional properties uh, like the mature uh, cell type that you would like to make, and how do we make more of these cells. So being able to do single cell measurements in that kind of context, again, would be very useful. And this is very, very well appreciated in the biological community. That's why single cell RNA sequencing has exploded over the past uh, five to 10 years. But RNA is not protein. Let me start with an anecdotal example of P53. If we measure the level of P53 protein and compare it to the mRNA level, we see that they don't correlate very well. In this particular case, Thanks to decades of research in various laboratories, we know that this is because P53 abundance is regulated primarily at the level of protein degradation. This is very well understood. But beyond this particular example, if, if we look more broadly across proteins that we can measure across lots of human tissues, for example, from the proteome draft map, uh, and the corresponding messenger RNAs, we see that the RNA levels are not very good at predicting the relative changes of proteins across different tissues. RNA abundances are quite good at predicting which are the abundant proteins. RNA levels are very high for ribosomal proteins or for histones. They're low for lowly abundant proteins, but if you wanted to know how a particular protein changes across different cell types and tissue types, then their predictive power is much lower. And this kind of phenomenon where you can have one type of statistical dependence within the whole data set and very different type within a subset of the data is very well known in statistics, has been known for decades as the Simpson's paradox. So it would be great to be able to measure proteins in single cells because the RNA measurements that we can do by sequencing are clearly insufficient. And they're also very noisy, something that I'll have more to say about in, in a few slides. Unfortunately, the methods that we have to measure proteins in single cells have been very limited. Most of these methods rely on antibodies, and they afford low specificity detection. Why is it low specificity? Because antibodies, in addition to binding their cognate protein, can bind a lot of other things. And these other things might be more abundant than the cognate protein, and the signal can be fairly nonspecific. And even the best methods have allowed multiplexing up to a few dozen, if you're generous, maybe 100 proteins measured in a sample. But this is far cry from measuring 10,000 proteins. So in starting my laboratory, I was very interested in being able to use mass spectrometry to push uh, in direction of both increasing the specificity of detection and increasing the throughput. Uh, and if, if you need uh, more information for the poor specificity of antibodies, you might find this estimate from Nature Curious. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Nature published this estimate that about a billion dollars is being wasted a year on poor antibodies that have low specificity. And this is not taking into account all of the follow-up experiments that are following false hypotheses suggested by faulty antibodies. That would be much more expensive. This is just buying an antibody that doesn't have the specificity that the label indicates. 
So we wanted to do something better. And here is the first piece of very good news. Proteins are far more abundant than messenger RNAs. Sure, a single mammalian cell is tiny. The proteins are not all that, all that abundant, but compared to the messenger RNAs, they're about a thousand fold or more, more abundant per cell. So then why is it difficult to measure them with mass spectrometry? Is it that the mass spec instruments are very insensitive? And that's generally not the case. Modern instruments can certainly quantify order 100 ions that have gotten inside of the instrument. A big part of the problem is how do you deliver the, the proteins from a single cell to the instrument efficiently? And then how do you do the quantification accurately? And I'm going to discuss about that. How do you identify the sequence of the peptide that you're quantifying? Because you don't just want to quantify an ion. That's not directly connected to biology. You'd like to know what is the sequence, of course. And here with this slide, I want to make a very important point that is going to run throughout the rest of my presentation about the difference between detection and quantification. It is sufficient to identify a single ion whose sequence you know to say that you detected the peptide, but you cannot really quantify the abundance of that peptide. Why is that the case? Because of sampling error. The problem is very similar to having to estimate the ratio between red and blue balls in a bucket. So if I give um, whom? Christoph. I'm going to give Christoph to sample five balls from the bucket. And he can ascertain with absolute certainty their color. It's a macroscopic object. He, he can tell uh, blue from red. But based on that something, he cannot estimate accurately the ratio between the balls because it's insufficient. And this kind of problem is perfectly described by the Poisson distribution. So if you apply the math to what's happening with single cell RNA sequencing, and to take the highest efficiency of RNA sampling reported in the literature, very, in, in the very favorable case, you end up having about 50% measurement error here, even for relatively abundant messenger RNA, for median abundant messenger RNA. And this is not, this is assuming that sample preparation is impeccable, absolutely perfect. Measurement is perfect. This is just due to the sampling. And with proteins being so much more abundant, even if we have a hundredfold lower efficiency of sampling, we still end up having much better estimates of their relative abundances. And for me, this has been a very inspiring realization. And I'm going to show you later in my talk some evidence that uh, this is not just math, but this is well borne out by empirical measurements. And at the time when I was having these thoughts, I started thinking, so how can we actually make this a reality? How we can measure proteins in single cells? And then we identified a number of specific uh, approaches that we can use to make quantification of proteins in single cells possible. And these include improvements in sample preparation, dramatic reduction in volume. It makes no sense to lyse a single cell in one mil of buffer. Uh, we are going to lose all the proteins, so obviously we need to reduce it. It makes no sense to have an army of students laboring to prepare single cells. We want to have automation. We want to be able to analyze hundreds of thousands, millions of single cells. Chromatography is a very important aspect to efficiently delivering uh, uh, the, the proteins to the instrument. And there are ways to improve the sampling, both by improving the separation or simply by sampling more completely the elution peaks by accumulating ions for a longer period of time. And there are important improvements both on the side of instrumentation, uh, where we can have parallel, parallel accumulation uh, serial uh, analysis of the ions, high multiplexing, and so on. So I was really excited because it seemed like it's feasible to do these things. And then I had this problem starting my, my lab. I had no access to an instrument, actually. And what made it possible for me to test some of these ideas and to start going was my friendship with the manager at the facility of Harvard, the, the mass spec facility at Harvard, Bogdan Budnik. He played an important role in providing access to instrumentation. And together with uh, a couple of undergraduates, particularly Ezra Levy uh, from Northeastern and, and Guillaume, uh, we started testing uh, if we can do the sample prep uh, so that we lyse the cells cleanly, we are able to deliver them to the instrument. And uh, that was very, very exciting because each of these steps was unknown and turned out to work quite well. Um, and then, after a while, 
the bosses at Harvard said, no, 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 no fun without pain. So they weren't happy with the facility manager running samples without me paying. And then again, I was without instruments. And to the rescue came the NIH director. Uh, I received the NIH director's award, which allowed me to purchase an instrument for, uh, for my lab, and then to recruit a really talented group of people who has done uh, all the work that I'm going to present. Uh, and let me explain conceptually what we are doing, and then I'll focus more on some specific examples. Uh, the first step is being able to lyse the cells, as I already mentioned, in very small volume without losing the material. And if we use chemicals to lyse them, then these chemicals tend to interfere with the mass spectrometry, and they had no courage to purify them. So we came up with a method that lyses cells just physically in pure water. So there's nothing to clean up, and I'm going to tell you in a minute how this works. But we start with clean cell lyses of, cell, of single cells sorted into the multi-well uh, plate. And then we digest the proteins into peptides. We label with TMT. And the other thing that is special here, all of this is automated, I should say, importantly. And another thing that is unusual and special here, that in addition to single cells in a TMT set, we also have this carrier material comprised of about 100 cells. And it will become clear in a moment why, why we need that. Uh, and then we subject our TMT set to LCMSMS analysis. What the carrier cells help tremendously with is to reduce losses from the nano LC chromatography because a lot of non-specific losses on walls and chromatographic surfaces are going to be taken by the carriers. And they also provide ions, peptide fragments, to assist the identification of peptides. And, and that really gives us a degree of robustness that enables us to uh, sequence peptides from uh, single cells without using extreme technology that will be uh, highly sensitive and, um, and unstable. Um, now, the methodology of, of doing this has been described in multiple papers listed here, and we have supplementary websites with videos and protocols that can help you if you're interested in, in trying out our experimental design. But equally important to the experiments is analysis. Analysis of the data is pivotal if you wanted to learn something from the experiment and not get confused just with noise. Uh, and you can see that max quant is very central to all of the analysis that we do, uh, not only because of the quantification, not only because of the evidence file, but, al but also because of all of the tables of really, really useful information that uh, helps us identify how to optimize our um, LCMSMS, and to have a lot more to say about that. It's, it's a very useful feature of MaxQuant that, in my opinion, is not fully utilized. Um, so I already mentioned that I did not dare to try to lyse single cells with detergents and then clean up the detergents. The first generation of lyses that we used was based on focused acoustic sonication with a specialized instrument. That worked, but it was low throughput, manual, expensive. So I always knew it was just a proof of principle. It wasn't going to be my Model T technology. The current method that we use and that we have published is based on minimal proteomic sample preparation uh, that substantially reduced the volume in which we lyse the cells. Again, we lyse them in pure water and made automation possible. And now we have third generation method that has driven the volume of sample preparation to low nanoliters to picoliter volumes that we are, we are developing. So how does MPOP work? Uh, it's extremely simple. Uh, though this simplicity might be a little bit misleading because we tried a dozen, dozens of different methods. Harris and Speck tried them, and we, we started by trying freeze-thaw. And freeze-thaw has been widely used for cell lysis, doesn't require chemicals, but the problem is that uh, it also doesn't extract proteins efficiently for mass spectrometry. You can certainly get some proteins, you can get some identification, but we could demonstrate by controlled experiments that it's just not efficient enough. And then we iterated and tried a lot of different methods and came up with this very simple procedure of just freezing the cells, heating them, and then digesting with trypsin. Now, does it work? I tell you it works, but you shouldn't take my word. What is the evidence that it works? 
So we did this controlled experiment where we mixed light cells lysed in urea, a very standard protocol. We lysed heavy cells with MPOP, and then we mixed them together. Why did we mix them together? Because they wanted to dirty the, the clean samples with urea, and then clean up together the cell sliced urea and the cell sliced with MPOP so that they can incur the same losses in both samples. And therefore, whatever differences they measure downstream with silic just correspond to the efficiency of sample of protein extraction. They don't correspond to losses from cleanup. I didn't want to deal with quantifying exactly how much we lose from the cleanup procedure. And when we look at the data, we find that across different times of digestion and label swaps, the extraction of proteins by MPOP is actually more efficient than with urea. And this is true for proteins from any compartment of the cell. It is true for proteins from the nucleus. It is true for proteins from the cytoplasm. It is true for proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum. It is true for proteins from the mitochondria. It is true for proteins from any organelle that we tested for. And let me tell you a little bit about my struggles and how Max Quant saved me from this. When I started in the early days trying to do uh, measurements in single cells, most of the time we got noise and data that made no sense. And they spent a week doing data exploration, what, what went wrong. And I found myself over and over again generating the same plots from the very useful tables of Max Quant. And at some point, I decided, can I automate this? But let me tell you a bit more about this analysis, how it works, why, why we need it. Let's say you did an experiment and you get a few peptides. Do you know what the problem is? Not really, because there are a few dozen different problems that can manifest with having a few peptides. It could be that your chromatography failed. It could be that there were very few ions during MS1 survey scans, so the instrument didn't send anything for MS2. It could be that the instrument had low sensitivity or very inefficient transferring to MS2. Or you have a ton of PSMs, but their confidence is just low enough and doesn't pass your threshold. And all of these, and many, many more, and all of these different possibilities, they would require different kind of troubleshooting. So it would be really useful to know which one of those happened to, to cause few peptides. And again, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure this out. Let me give you another example with racial compression. Racial compression is something that is sometimes discussed as though that is a specific problem that people know what it is. No, it's a highly, highly nonspecific symptom that can be caused by a variety of different causes. It could be that there is a lot of co-isolation as part of a TMT experiment. Equally, it could be that there is cross-labeling, and that can happen with SILAC2. Some of your sample 2 was labeled with a label for sample 4. It could be that there is LC carryover on the column. And that actually happens quite a lot when you try to do ultra-sensitive analysis, because even small amounts of material left from previous runs can contribute substantially to the signal from lowly abundant samples. It could be that there is nonlinear measurement of the detector itself, low signal-to-noise ratio. And all of these possibilities are exceptionally time consuming to tackle one by one doing the data exploration, which is what I was doing, pushing that cart of circular wheels on square wheels. So what I did here is I noticed that these are circular, this is square, and they did the exchange. So we basically did something incredibly simple. We took all of the really useful information from max one tables and plotted them as part of a very interactive um, set of, of distribution plots, mostly, so that on the same screen you can see information about MS1 level, MS2 level, the apex targeting, the efficiency of ion delivering at all of the stages, and very, very quickly you can narrow down the possibilities as to what went wrong with whatever the problem in, in the data is, and this has been very useful for us. Um, I'll give you here one specific example uh, of optimizing an experiment, but there are certainly a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of other use cases. And let's consider first this panel, looking at the position of the elution peak that was sent for MS2 analysis. 
In a particular run, we found that most of the eyes were being MSMS too early. We had very poor apex targeting. And then we thought rationally, so how can you help with that? Without being able to do apex targeting in some very clever, efficient way. Well, what if you increase the duty cycle length? You can do that either by increasing top N or by increasing accumulation time. So in this case, we tried increasing accumulation times. So if you increase accumulation times, then you see that progressively you begin to MSMS more and more ions closer to the apex. So you don't solve completely the problem, you don't MSMS every ion at the apex, but you go from MSMSing maybe 5% at the apex to MSMSing 50% plus at the apex, and then that's a good trade-off, very easy to optimize. And this, not surprisingly, results in being able to deliver substantially more ions for the MS2 scans, and also results in substantially higher number of peptides being confidently identified across all levels of confidence. It's extremely simple, and you can only do it if you start with this plot to know what the problem is. And if you want to use the software DoMS, you can go to this website here uh, that has uh, detailed tutorials and videos uh, by Gray Huffman, who, who developed it, and he can tell you more about how to use it. And then another thing that we worked on to enhance the interpretation of um, scope MS data is to increase the confidence in our PSMs. Because we were using this kind of plots here to look at PSMs at all confidence level, not just at 1% FDR, we could tell that there is a large number of PSMs here that don't survive the FDR cutoff, but they actually have reasonably high confidence, and we wanted to know, can we increase our confidence in these PSMs, in the correct ones, and then throw away the garbage because some of these low confidence PSMs, they're actually incorrect. That's why we don't want to use them. So we wanted to better separate them. And then we worked on developing a Bayesian framework to do that, that incorporates retention time information. And if you want to incorporate retention time information, you first have to estimate what the retention time is for each peptide. And we developed this uh, global retention time alignment framework that allows us to derive very accurate estimates for the retention time. So here these distributions correspond just to the error between the estimated and the observed retention time. And this framework, Dart AD, allows us to get very accurate estimates. And this is important because the more accurate the estimate is, the more informative it is for the peptide sequence, the larger the change in the confidence in PSM. And when we incorporate these estimates within a Bayesian framework that I'm not going to explain in details here, uh, we, we are able to increase the number of peptides identified from over 100% for the very high confidence uh, FDR to about 50-60% at 1% FDR. And then this brings the total number of uh, MSMSs that result in usable PSMs to about 60%. So it gives you a fairly substantial increase in the usable data um, for downstream analysis. And this uh, Bayesian framework is very easy to extend to other types of uh, informative features for the peptide sequence. For example, uh, mobility times measured from team stuff, drift times, ion mobility, and, and so on. So in the remaining time, I want to tell you uh, just a short vignette of some biology that we have learned by doing single cell measurements. And that starts with this question as to why are macrophages different? Now first, what are macrophages? Macrophages are a very important immune cell type that are present residents in all of your tissues. And what is interesting about macrophages is that they can have very different functions. They can be either pro-inflammatory or they can be anti-inflammatory. They can either eat bacteria or they can promote angiogenesis and cancer growth. Or sometimes they can fight the cancer. So it's really important to know what's driving these differences. And we know that these differences can be induced by polarizing cytokines. But we were also interested to see uh, what, what happens if we start from homogeneous culture of monocytes and let them differentiate without polarizing cytokines? What will happen? And this is the experiment we did. We started with monocyte cells. They're not a blood cell type, fairly small, about 10 microns in diameter that flow throughout uh, the, the bloodstream everywhere. And we simulated their differentiation with PMA 
into, into macrophages. Then we collected uh, cells, uh, either those that were not exposed to the PMA and therefore they stayed monocytes, or from the macrophages and to incorporate them into scope two sets. And there are two things worthwhile emphasizing here. One of this is the experimental design of randomizing uh, the position of the single cells where we put a monocyte or a macrophage because we didn't want to have any systematic uh, effects in, let's say, the measurements that we have from monocytes because of their positions in the TMT set or which TMT set they get into. Uh, and we also included control wells in which we did everything that we did to a single cell, except that we didn't put a single cell. The reason for that is we wanted to have controls for our background. How much of what we measure are just ions floating from the air, our dirty fingers, and anything else. As much as we have tried to limit that, we didn't want to trust that we have eliminated them. We wanted to have a measure about the degree to which we have succeeded with that. And then, of course, we included a reference channel that would allow us to put the data from these 62 sets into the same matrix on the same scale. Then, the first thing that we do when we get the data is we see how much signal there is and can we trust the data. And we've looked at a lot of different metrics for that. Uh, some single cells may be dying when you sort them or you may fail to sort them and then you don't want to use that particular channel because that would just contribute noise. Or it could be that somehow the digestion and labeling failed. So we want to have a measure for all of these things. We want to know did it work. And the first plot here that I'm showing is just the signal that we get from the different uh, single cell samples from the reference and here from the carrier normalized to the carrier. So by definition the carrier here is zero. And we can see that uh, in the control wells where we put nothing, we didn't put a cell, we put TMT, trypsin, and so on, uh, the, most of the peptides have zero report around intensity detected. That's good, essentially all of them. We can see that right next to the control well, we have an example of a failed monocyte that also gave us the same result. Either we failed to sort it or we failed to digest it or something else happened, but we want to know that because we don't want to use it for the analysis. And then we can see that for most of the single cells, about 80 to 90% of the report ions have high signal to noise ratio that is not zero, that is above the threshold. And if we look across all of the data sets now, uh, in the space of these relative report Ryan ratios that we are plotting here on the y-axis and the coefficient of variation computed for the consistency of quantifying a protein from the different peptides. And very importantly here, I want to emphasize that this coefficient of variation is based on the relative peptide levels. It's not based on absolute report Ryan intensities, but their intensities relative to the reference. Then we can see that uh, about 80% of the signal cells have low coefficient of variation and high signal and they're therefore suitable for analysis and about the, the other 20% appear to have some sort of a problem and to exclude from the analysis and the beauty of this is that it's completely objective and it, it also identifies every single control wells. So 0% of the control wells fall into the uh, quadrant of usable data. Now, MaxQuant also gives us an estimate for how pure are our MS2 spectra, and we have worked very, very hard to improve the purity of our MS2 spectra, because if they're not pure, then you get co-isolation and our quantitation is not very accurate. So the median precursor ion fraction, which is the MaxQuant estimate for purity of, of the spectra, is uh, here for each set we take the median, and the median of the medians is 95%. So we are pretty happy with this. And again, this was achieved by iterative optimization using the DUMS um, software package. And currently, we can assign very confident peptide sequence at 1% FDR to about 40-something, uh, 40, uh, 40 between 40 and 50% of the ions that were sent for MS2 analysis. And while we can certainly improve that, I'm quite happy being in that position. And again, part of the reason to have this relatively high identification rate is DART ID, the fact that we can use retention time information to increase the, the confidence in peptide assignments. How many 
peptides and proteins we identify. We have about 2,000 peptides from uh, a single cell, and that corresponds roughly to 1,000 proteins being quantified in a single cell. And I'll have much more to say about the, in, just in the next slide about the difference between identified and quantified. But we're not gonna analyze single scope sets. We are gonna analyze all of them together put into a big matrix. So the more relevant metric for the depth of coverage is how many proteins are quantified across a large enough number of single cells so that they can be useful for, for analysis. And if we look at that metric, we, we have on the order of about uh, 2,000 proteins without any missing data in, in a few cells, in, in 10, 5 cells, and we have uh, about 1,000 proteins that have absolutely no missing data in, in 50 or more cells. And what you, the, the important part of this figure here, actually, are not the numbers on the y-axis, but the shape of these curves, that they are all going up. So what this is telling you is that if we were to analyze more single cells, which is what you're doing, and obviously what we should do, then the coverage also increases because there would be more proteins that are detected across a large enough number of cells. So how do we do in this metric? I mean, I told you this song and dance that I got into this field because I was interested in doing quantitation, not detection, but are we there? Are we actually delivering enough ions from single cells to do quantification? And Alexander Makarov helped us to convert our measured numbers from orbit traps into ion copy numbers. So with, with his help, we used the conversion formula that allowed us to estimate what is the copy number from each peptide from a single cell that is analyzed in the orbit trap. And we find that for proteins, for, for peptides, this is, uh, between, uh, this is tens to, to hundreds of, uh, of copies. And for proteins, because they have multiple peptides, this is about 100 copies sampled per protein which corresponds to about 10% coefficient of variation due to the sampling alone. This, while uh, already being quite good, can certainly be improved by increasing the delivery of uh, ions, for example, sampling longer the elution peak, further optimizing the sample preparation. But even at this point, it compares very favorably to the number of copies sampled by single cell RNA sequencing. So here, the blue distribution is for copy number of reads from messenger RNAs, from macrophages, the same cell type, the same genes. So we took the overlap of the genes quantified in the single cell RNA sequencing and the scope sets. And because we wanted to do a controlled comparison, the only kind of comparison worthwhile doing. And we, you can see here that uh, this coefficient of variation associated with doing the single cell RNA sequencing measurements is substantially higher. It's 80% or so. And what is very important to emphasize here is that single cell RNA sequencing, as noisy as it is, has actually been very powerful in identifying cell types, identifying new rare cells. And this is underscoring that even if you have a lot of noise, with the appropriate statistical analysis and large enough number of measurements, you, you can extract some useful signal from the data. But I'm certainly excited that we can extract much more signal, much more accurate quantification. Uh, and these are early steps in single cell proteomics. It's, uh, it's just a beginning that I believe we can substantially increase. So we did a lot of benchmarks to more directly estimate what is the accuracy of our quantification. Let me show you here just one of these uh, done at a high throughput scale. Now, you cannot directly compare measurements in single cells to bulk because you don't expect that they should be the same. Single cells are different from the bulks. But then what you can do is, thank you. Thank you, Petra. What you can do is you can take lots of lots of single cells Average them, average them out in silico and compare them to the average out ratios from the bulk measurement. Because this is what you do when you take a bulk sample. When you lyse the cells, you mix them physically. And in this case, we have the single cell measurements, lots of single cells, and we take the average across the single cells. And we compare the relative quantitation between the averages for the single cells and for the bulk 
And we were quite happy with the result. We, we have reliability of about 90% of this measurement, actually higher because our bulk measurements also would have some measurement error. And this compares very, very favorably to the uh, best single cell RNA sequencing methods. They cannot get half of that reliability at, at, at this level. So if you just look at all of the data projected onto their principal components, not surprisingly, the largest principal component here uh, distinguishes the monocytes from macrophages in our experiment. And then we can, we can verify that in two ways. One is when we sorted these cells, we, we knew what cell we are sorting in each well. We have labels associated with them. So here we just plot the labels. But you can also color code each cell by the average level of proteins associated with either monocytes and macrophages. And if you do that, Again, you can identify very well that um, uh, these cells are separated by cell type. And in this case, you could, you could have actually done the novel discovery of, of the markers, even if you didn't have the, the labels. So then we wanted to look a little bit more deeply into these data and to use this graph-based method for clustering single cells, where we make a graph uh, where each node corresponds to a single cell and the edges correspond to the similarity between the proteomes of the single cells. You can use different metrics to compute that similarity. We use Pearson correlation, not important. You can use something else. And there are algorithms such as spectral clustering that operate on the location of the, of the network that allow you to identify clusters of cells that are all closely connected, have lots of edges in between, strong edges, and have very weak edges to other clusters. And what, what I like about this method is that it's, it's very objective, principled, global, and you can solve it by doing um, this convex optimization here that gives you a, a unique solution that also has very nice physical interpretation, but I'm not gonna, I, I don't have much more time to talk about it, so let me just show you the result. We, we took the uh, smallest uh, eigenvector of the Laplacian with a non-constant eigenvector. There is a trivial solution with a constant eigenvector, but separate issue. And we just sorted the cells based on the values of the corresponding elements in the eigenvector. Why did we do that? Because we didn't want to assume that there are two discrete clusters. We wanted to see, are there two discrete clusters or not? And if you do that, uh, you do find indeed that uh, these two clusters tend to be mostly discrete with some cells in between. Interestingly enough, the cells in between don't appear to be so much noisy as they appear to be more, more partially differentiated because they show these concerted protein changes of, of um, hundreds of proteins in this case. And if we look at the biological annotation of these proteins, uh, they, uh, uh, the biological annotation uh, very nicely uh, confirms what is known about the biology of these cells and what we would expect. In particular, we find that the, the proteins that are more abundant in monocytes, which are highly active proliferative cells, are, in, are associated with DNA replication, nucleosome assembly, <coughs> ribosome biogenesis, these cells grow actively. While the proteins that are more abundant in the macrophages here are involved with cell adhesion, these cells adhere, they're not suspension, that makes sense. Cells uh, with uh, Im immune receptors and other uh, immune-related pathways. Now, here comes the really cool result. If you do this same analysis to the, macro to the macrophages, basically do the Laplacian clustering, uh, compute the Laplacian vector of the graph of macrophages and sort them out, now you find that, uh, ag that, again, you can see two clusters, but these two clusters no longer look discrete. It is much more of a continuum of proteome states starting from here to here of the macrophages. And we wanted to have a more quantitative view of this. Are we just seeing discrete clusters here and continuum here, or is this really true? And one way to do that is just to plot the distribution of the elements of the Laplacian vector. And if you do that here, you find that for the monocytes and macrophages, that distribution is highly bimodal, each mode corresponding to the cell types. Well, for the macrophages, you have a unimodal broad distribution, again, consistent with this interpretation that instead of having two discrete clusters, there is just a broad spectrum of proteome states. And what are these proteome states? 
can we, I mean, are they biological or do they have some other meaning? Are they artifactual? So what was particularly exciting for us is that when uh, we intersected these proteins with proteins known to be abundant in either M1 polarized or M2 polarized macrophages, we saw this very strong linear correlation, suggesting that one end of the spectrum here corresponds to the M1 polarized macrophages, while the other end of the spectrum corresponds to the M2 polarized macrophages. And this is pretty remarkable because normally people generate, think that M1 and M2 polarized macrophages originate because of cytokines that trigger their polarization. You need to have a specific dedicated signal to tell that cell to become M1 or M2 polarized. In this case, what we see is that cells that are just growing, starting from homogeneous cell culture, uh, growing in homogeneous environment, have this tendency to polarize into, into either direction. Let me see how much time I have. Um, okay, so I'll have to conclude fast, actually. I will not have time to tell you some of the really exciting things. But let me just say that um, obviously one can do, uh, can use these uh, single cell protein measurements to identify new cell types as part of various uh, cell type, tissue type atlases. And that's a good use. Um, in fact, we already are part of the Chan Zuckerberg initiative in, in, in doing this kind of analysis. But uh, what I'm far more excited is not just to classify cells, but to do models and to understand biology, to go beyond the descriptive association, oh, this cluster is these cells and this cluster is those cells, but be able to identify molecular mechanisms. Uh, there are a number of biomarkers that can be discovered only by looking within single cells or the correlations of proteins within single cells. I'm very excited about studying post-transcriptional regulation in single cells. We, we've done very, very little of this, mostly because uh, the technology has been lacking to be able to obtain relevant information. So I'm very interested, for example, in studying ribosome specialization and how the modifications of ribosomes contribute to shaping cell type, tissue type specific proteomes. And for identifying causal mechanisms, it seems that uh, every time I give this, uh, in this talk, I don't have enough time to, <laughs> to describe how we can do this, but uh, I recently gave an hour uh, long talk at the Broad Institute specifically dedicated of how we might be able to use the single cell protein measurements to uh, directly identify causal mechanisms, which you can find from, from this link here. You can, you can watch the video. Uh, so in the case of the ribosomes, we can identify whether this heterogeneity between the ribosomes that we have seen from bulk tissues is uh, present there because there is heterogeneity within a single cell or because different cells have uh, different modifications on, on their ribosomes. Going to skip this. Um, the, core, the core idea here is that um, So in some sense, inferring causality in biology can be quite easy. If you just put glucose on, a, on cells growing in tissue culture and you measure downstream protein changes or RNA changes, you can say that they have been caused by the glucose. But this kind of causality is also not very useful because you don't know what is the mechanism uh, triggering, uh, mediating the response. And that is what's really hard to identify. This is precisely the situation with data from genome-wide association studies. If you have a SNP that you know is causal about hypercholesterolemia, or it's causal for HMG CoA reductase, very, very important enzyme that is target of the, of the most uh, profitable pharmaceutical in the world. Even if this causal association is bona fide and correct, it is consistent with uh, practically infinite number of models, different molecular mechanisms, because you don't have the direct association between the SNP and the downstream effect. And then you can write models that is mediated by one transcription factor, two transcription factor, kinase activating a transcription factor, uh, the mediator complex that associates with different transcription factors. All of these models simultaneously, there are just too many possibilities. And that's one of the real bottlenecks in being able to, uh, to derive actionable uh, research strategies from genome-wide association studies and other causal associations. And the idea is that the models that uh, people have tried to use to identify the, the, protein, um, the proteins from these networks have uh, 
um, always locked, either locked the, the, um, uh, the variables that mediate those interactions, they're latent variables, so it's very hard to do anything with that, or they have been forced to make very unrealistic assumptions about messenger RNAs interacting with each other, having linear dependence, or so on and so forth. And if, uh, if we could measure enough single cell on the proteins across enough single cells, we can just take a section within the joint distribution that we directly infer from the data and we can infer direct uh, causal interactions between proteins and the protein network so that we can really have a systematic approach to identify the mechanisms regulating uh, the, the association. Uh, this is the team, the awesome team that did a lot of the work that I had the pleasure of presenting. Uh, we are funded by the NIH Director's Award and have lots of positions. We are looking for, if, if you're interested in the results that I presented, uh, come and talk to me either today, tomorrow, or send me an email. We have positions for people who would like to do experimental work, computational work. If you want to do both, that's even better. So if you have any interest, come and talk to me. And with that, I'll finish and take uh, any questions that you may have.